the long sheet by William Sanson. Have you ever wrung dry a wet cloth, wrung it bone wide dry, with only the grip of your fingers and the muscles of your arms? If you have done this, you will understand better the situation of the captives at the Visee, when the warders set them the task of the long sheet. You will remember how, having stretched the long claw between your hands, you begin by twisting one end, holding the other firm so that the water is corkscrewed from its hiding place. At first, the water spurts out easily, but later you will find yourself screwing with both hands in different directions, winding your knuckles, straining every fiber of your diaphragm, and all to extract the smallest drop of moisture. The muscle of your arms swells like an egg, yet the drop remains a pine head. As you work, the claw will gradually change from a gray color to whiteness of dry and bone, yet even the cloth will be wet. Still, you will knock your muscles. Still, you will wrench away the furtive dam. Then, at last, you will believe the claw to be dry. But in the next second, the tip of your fingers will quiver tragically as it touch some cold hidden veil of them clinging deep down in their interlaced threads. Such then was the task of the captives. They were placed in a longer steel box of a random room with no windows and no doors. The room was some six feet wide and six feet high, but it ran 100 feet in length. It resembles thus a rectangular tunnel with no entrance and no exit. Yet, the sensation inside was not really that of a tunnel. For instance, a quantity of light flowed through the thick glass panels set at intervals along the ceiling. These were the skylights, and through these, the captives had draw in the box. Again, the impression of living in a tunnel was offset by a system of cubicles walls that separated the captives into groups. These cubicles walls were made from the same riveted steel as the main walls. There was no communication from the cubicle to the cubicle, except through a half foot of space left between the top of the walls and the ceiling. Those which group of captives occupied as they were a small room. There were 22 captives. They were grounded in unequal groups within your cubicles. Through the entire length of the system, raised three feet from the ground, passing through the very center of each room, ran a long wood sheet. It was made from coarse wire linen bundle into a loose cylinder of cloth, some six inches in diameter. When the captives were first thrown into their room, their cubicles, the long sheet was heavy with water. The warders had soaked the material so truly that in the folds of the water had gathered into lakes. The warders then answered the instructions. The captives were to wring the sheet dry. With wood, it would not do to wring the sheet to what we would normally call a dry state, as of clothes re ready for airing, or contrary, the sheet must be purged of every moisture, it must be wrung as dry as bone. This, the warders concluded, might take a long time, it might even take months or hard work. In fact, they had taken special care to treat the lining so that it would be durable over a lengthy period of time. But when the task was finally completed, then the men had and women would be granted their freedom. They would be released. As the gray faces of the warders disappeared and the glass kind of slid shut, the captives smiled for the first time. For months, they had lived with the fear of death. They had shrunk in ceaseless apprehension of the terrible devices that awaited them. And now, the future had evolved into the ringing of a simple sheet. A long sheet. It was true, but child's play in comparison with what they had expected. 
Thus they sank to the steel bar floor in relief. Few laid a hand on the sheet that day. But after three months, the captives began to realize the true extent of their task. By this time, each group in each cubco had run the worst water from their section of the sheet. Yet, with all their sweating and straining, they could not rid the cloth of its limb less dampness. It was apparent that the warders had no intention of presenting them with a simple task. For, through vents near the roof, hot steam was injected mechanically into the cubicle as long as daylight lasted. This steam naturally moistened the sheet afresh. The steam was so regulated that it hindered it rather than prevent the fulfillment of the ringing. Thus, there was always less steam entering the moisture rung from the sheet as a normal rate of work. The steam injection merely meant that, for every 10 drops of water rung, 7 new drops would settle upon the sheet, so that eventually the captives would still be able to wring the sheet dry. This device of the warders was introduced solemnly to complicate the task. It seemed that the warders were acting in two ways. Daily, they encouraged the efforts of the captives with promises of release but daily, they turn on the steam cocks. In the cubicles, the air was thick with steam. It was the air of a laundry, where steam catches in the drill, where it's sometimes difficult to breathe, where the smell of hot, wet cloth sickens the heart. The steel walls sweat. Condensed water trickle hiding trails down the great plate. Beds of moisture cluster at rivet heads. The long shoes patter a few drops into the central gutter and the floor as the captives twisted against time. Both men and women worked half naked since the sheet was positioned at three feet from the ground. They were forced to stoop. If they sat at their work, then their arms grew numb in the raised attitude at which they had to be maintained. There was nothing for it but to stop. In the hot air, they sweated. Yet they dared not lean over the sheet for the fear their sweat should fall on the hungry cloth. For their muscles knocked, their backs cried out as they twisted. The end was far, but there was an end. That meant that there was hope. This knowledge lent fire to the struggling ambition that lived in their human hearts. They worked. Yet, yeah, some were not always equal to the task. Room 3. Those who saw outside. There were four rooms. Take room 3. This housed five people. Two married couples and a young Serbian grocer. All five of them wanted freedom. They worked earnestly at their task that the task was, in a sense, unproductive, did not worry them. At least, it would produce their freedom. It was thus artificially productive. These five people set about the problem in a normal business-like way. Previously, they had been used to habitual hour, hours, a life of steady formula. This they now apply to new business of ringing, set hours, were allotted to each person. It was as if they commuted regularly from their suburbia, the steel sleeping corner, to the office, the long sheet. They worked in relays in four hour stretches throughout the day and night. However, as I have said, they are not equal to the task. The framework of habit overcame them. Like so many who live within a steady, comfortable routine, they allowed the routine around the work to predominate in importance above the work itself. They arrived at the long ship punctually, and with consciousness dissatisfied, they put insufficient effort into the actual work. Furthermore, when they had fulfilled the routine assiduously for a period, one or the other would congratulate his conscience and really believe that he deserved a little relaxation. 
and he would take the afternoon off. Such was the force of his emphasis on obedience to the letter that he was convinced the law would not suffer. Thus, the e real working of ringing suffering, new moisture crept when, when his hands were weak. These people had said about the quest for freedom in the right way, but they were unhappily convinced of their righteousness. Sometimes, one or other of the couples would lie down together as sweating steel plates. They would make love as the steam misted their bodies with foul perspirations. One of the women became pregnant. Her child was born in the steam box. But under the influence of the room streets routine, that child could never be free. The influence of constriction and the hopeless task of the parents would keep the child in the steam box for life. The child would never have the chance to learn to ring with effect. Room 2. Those who saw in and out and around. In another of the rooms, room 2, there were five men. Their names and their professions do not matter. It is how they attacked the long sheet that matter. They attacked it in five different ways. Here were five individuals, five who were forced by the sheet of their minds to approach their problems in various ways of their own. Day after day, they labor in the hot, damp steel cubco, each twisting the long cylinder of cloth, with different reasonings. One man had been frightened by a sweat when he was young, on some indefinite day of his childhood. A new nurse had appeared. Her black eyes had burned with powerful scorn. Her small, vicious teeth and huge dropping cheeks had threatened him in the candlelight. On her first day, the new nurse had made a little white monster from a white sheet. It had two heads and a shapeless flowing body. The little head was sharp and always bobbing. The nurse had come silently into the night nursery when we, it was dark, lining a candle on the floor behind the end of the bed. She had quietly raised her little white monster so that the boy could just see it above his toes. Then she had begun a strident sing song crying, like the harsh cry of a punch. The boy had awoken to the sound and had seen the sharp bobbing heads of the little monster. Now, some t 30 years later, the man has forgotten the scene, but somehow his hands cannot touch the long sheet if without a great sensation, sensation of uneasiness. His hands do not touch the white cloth well. Consequently, he is forever making excuses to avoid working on the sheet. He feigns illness. He offers to clear up the extreme of all the others. He has mutilated his hands. He has attempted to make love with the others for a man to avoid the reality of the sheet. Oh, there is no end. To the devices the fellow has invented from his sadness. But whatever he does cannot eradicate the awful uneasiness that clouds the far reaches of his mind. At the moment of writing, this man is still in steel cubicle. He will never be free. Another of the men in room two was a simple quiet fellow. The other took no interest in him. He was too simple a fellow. Yet, a most amazing thing, his section of the sheet was white and quite dry. There was a good reason for this. If without any consciousness knowledge, if without planning and scheming, he had naturally gone at the, his ringing, the good way. He was accustomed to ring, sitting astride the cloth. In this position, his legs squeezed at the cloth too. Those, if without questioning, he surrendered his whole body to the task, his heart too, for he was such a simple fellow. This man's she was dry, but the others never even noticed he was such a simple fellow. There was one man in room two 
whose mercury in life had always been the shortcut. As previously in business, in love, in all relationships, he attempted to apply the shortcut system to the most important task of all, the ringing of the long sheet. He tried all a great many tricks and pre-deceptions. He blocked up the pipe through which the guard pumped the steam. The next morning, like a mushroom, another pipe had grown at the side of the first. He tried feigning madness. The waters threw buckets of cold water down through the skyline. Some of this water splashed on the sheet, destroying a whole month of work. The other man nearly killed him for this. Once he bribed one of the warders to send him a paw of white enamel. With this painting, the sheet why? The enamel dry hard, the sheet seemed dry, but the next day the warders came to ship the enamel off. They punished him with a traveling hose jet. This jet traveled inconsequently about the room. To save the water hitting the sheet, the man had no intercept the jet with his body. He was kept running and jumping and squatting for a whole day until the towards evening he dropped to exhausted. Then there was another man who can best be described as a fumbler. He worked hard and earnestly. He was up at the ringing well before the others. He seldom lay down too long after the skylights were dark and the air clear of steam. But the fumbled his mind coordinated imperfectly with his body. Although he felt that he concentrated his whole effort, psyche and physical on the job of ringing, his mind would wander to other things. He never knew that this happened, but his hands did. They stopped ringing, they rang the wrong way, and the shadow drops of moisture accumulated. He could never understand this. He thought his mind was always on the job, but instead, his mind settled too often on matters only, near to the job, not the job in a sense. For a small instance, his mind might wander to the muscle uh, on his left forearm. He might see that it bulges a downward screw of the wet lining. He, he watches this bulge as he works. The bulge then absorbs his interest to shoot such an extent that he makes greater play of his left arm to stimulate further the bulge of muscle. In compensation, the right arm slackens its effort. The ringing becomes uneven and inefficient. Yet, all this time, he himself and honestly believes that he he is concentrating upon his job. The muscle is, in fact, part of the job, yet it is only a face, not the full perspective. He fumbles because he does not see clearly. And to ring dry the long sheet, a man must give his whole thought in calm and complete clarity. The fifth man in the room, too, was a good worker. That is, he had found a way to ring effectu effectively. And at times, his proportion of the sheet was almost dry, but he was perverted. This man liked it to ring the sheet almost dry, then stands by and watch the steam settle into the folds once more. He liked it to watch the fruits of his labor root. In this way, he freed himself from the task. He freed himself from attaining his object, and then treading it it with the scorn he imagined it deserved. He felt himself a master of the work, but in reality he never became the master of his true freedom. There was no purity in this man. He free his freedom was a false. Room four those who never saw at all. Room number four housed more captives than the others. Seven people were crowded into this one self steam and steel. There were three women, one girl of twelve, and three men. These people seldom did much work. 
there were a source of great disappointment to the warders. To these people, the effort was not worth eventual freedom. The immensity of the task had long ago disheartened them. Their minds were not big enough to envisage a better future. They had enough. They had their breathing and their food. They said our life had no interest for them. Vaguely, they would have preferred better conditions. By the cost of toil and thought, no. These people were squalid and small. Their desire for freedom had been killed by a due acceptance of their impotence. This also became true of the little girl of 12. She had no alternative but to follow the others. The warders never played their favorite trick on room 4, for the simple reason that the trick would have no effect. The trick was to release into the cell small squadrons of saturated birds. The birds flew into the cell and squared the water from their wings everywhere. The birds flew in all directions and the captives ran wildly here and there in a hysterical effort to trap them before they splashed water into the sacred sheet. The warders considered that the element of chains implicit in these birds was healthy innovation. Otherwise, life for the captives would have been too ordinary. There must be risk, say the warders, and so from the time to time, with no warning, they injected these little wet birds and captives hastened to protect the brood of their work against the interference of fate. If they could not catch the birds in time, they learned in this matter how to accept misfortune. And in patience, they rebounded the efforts to retrieve the former level of their work. But into room 4, the birds never flew. The tricks would never have the effect the inhabitants who live at the low ebb of moisture already. Perhaps the real tragedy of these disparate people was not their own misfortune, to which they had grown accustomed, but that there is lackness of its effect on those whose ambitions were poor and strong. This lackness was contagious in this way. The she was so wet in room 4 that the water seeped through into room 1. And in room 1 lived the most successful of the, all the captives. Room 1. Those who saw inside. There were five of them in the cubicle. One. Four men and one woman. They were successful, no more for their method of ringing than for their attitude towards ringing. At first, when they had been dropped through the skyline, when they saw the long sheet, when they slowly accustomed themselves to the idea of delay bef before them, they were profoundly shocked, unlike the others. They thought death preferable to such senseless and unproductive labor. But they were good people. Soon they saw beyond the opera and dodgery. Soon they had passed through the and rejected the various phases experienced and retained by the other rooms. They had known the death, defeat of room 4, the individual terror and escape of room 2, the vineyard of virtue beneath with the habit of room 3, poor with such alarming satisfaction. No, it was not so very long before these good people saw beyond the apparent and it. thenceforth set themselves to work with body and soul, gently, but with strength, humbly, yet fearlessly, towards the only end of value, freedom. First, these people said unproductive. The long sheet and a senseless drudgery, yes, but why not? In whatever other sphere of labor could we yet ever have to produce ultimately anything? It is not the production that counts, but the life lived in the spirit during production. Production, the tightening of the muscles, the waving of the hands, the pouring forth of shaped materials. This is only an employment for the nervous body. 
the dying legacy of hunters will to move. Let the hands weave, but at the same time let the spirit search. Give the long its rightful place and concentrate on a better understanding of the freedom that is our real object. At the same time, they saw to it that the shield was drawn efficiently. They arranged a successor road system. They tried various methods and positions with their hands, examining every detail. They selected in a every way the best approach. They did not overtax themselves. They did not hurry themselves. They worked with a rheumatic resilience, conserving this energy for the exertion of death. They allowed no extremes. They applied themselves with sincerity and goodwill. Above all, they had faith. Their attitude was abroad but led in one direction, the endeavor was freedom. They feared neither work nor weakness. These things did not exist for them. Their existence was a material through which they could achieve, by calm and sensitive understanding the goal of perfect freedom. Gradually, these people achieved their end, in spite of the steam, in spite of the saturated birds, in spite of the waterous contagious seeping through from the room of the defeat, in spite of the long hours and the heat and the scorching horizon rusting still, their spirit prevailed and they achieved the purity they sought. One day, seven years later, they were a gray sheet, dainted, a bright white, dry as desert ivory, dry as marble dust. They call up through the skylight to the warders. The grave face appeared. Coldly, the warders regarded the white sheet. There were nods of approbation. Freedom, said the captives. The guards brought out their great hoses and those at the white sheet stood in gray with a huge pressure of water. You already have it, they answered. Freedom lies in an attitude of spirit. There is no other freedom, and the sky lies silently closed. The Long Sheet was published in 1944 during the World War, and it talks about a lot how faith started to be important during the war because no one knew what would happen tomorrow. And the people that would have faith and believe in what they're doing and believe that there was something out there that was freedom were the people that made it true on the scene above. All they had faith. Their attitude was broad, but led in one direction. Their endeavor was freedom. Shows how faith in hope made it make true to dry the cloth and to get to get the point to be free and I think that plays out a lot in that time because you didn't know what was gonna happen the next day during war or what was gonna happen the next day in your life and people needed hope so freedom was an answer for a lot of things at that time on the second scene, you already have it, the answer. Freedom lies in an attitude of the spirit. There is no other freedom. And the sky lies silently closed. It talks about how a lot of things are in our head and not in what we need to do, what is happening to us. That you choose the things that happen to you. You can take an action or you cannot. It shows how humans have a lot of power over their lives and we can choose certain things. We certainly cannot choose what is going to happen to us, but we can choose how to react to these things that happen. On the article, it shows a silent tendency in the humanities by Raymond Tellis says, the, t the challenge of humanism, which is Indeed, the great adventure of humanity, at which humanity should be at heart, 
is to make sense of the human possibility of now appealing to the idea of God as a source of our meaning and destination. The rooms represent how uh, the humans are conditioned to their own and how answering their own philosophical questions are important to us and how we choose what happens, what, is, what are the consequences of the things that happen to us.